Aloha. This tradition of the Pacific Lecture is titled Hawaiian Fish Hooks, Now and Then, presented by Umi Kai. This lecture was recorded on October 17, 2013. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Emily Hawkins, and I'm from the Bishop Museum Association Council. And it's my joy tonight to introduce Umi, who is a valuable member of the council. And it is, it is our group that plans these programs called Traditions of the Pacific. And without resources like Umi, we, we wouldn't have these great programs for you. But um, you should know Umi has a regular day job. But his, his love and the thing that he's here for tonight is to talk to us about his workmanship with regard to making things that are culturally relevant for the Hawaiian culture. And he has a company called Kai Ko? Kai Company. <laughs> and it is um, that company encompasses not only Umi, but his wife as well. And it is she who did the beautiful lauhala work that's up here. But Umi works on tools, and they might be for war or peace, and they definitely would be for fishing. So without further ado, here we have Umi Kai. Mahalo uh, and aloha. Aloha kāko. Uh, e umi kai. Uh, umi ali loa lahana o kla kawa. Uh, my father is from uh, uh, Naalehu, Moku o Keawe. My mother is from Waimea, Moku o Keawe. Uh, I was born and raised in Kaimuki, Oahu, and uh, still reside there. Uh, my wife of 40 years, um, Lina Alakai, is uh, originally from Kahuku, or sorry, Laie, Kahuku grad. Uh, and uh, her father was one of the people that uh, started me um, getting more interested in, in fishing, not necessarily in hooks, because he was a throw net fisherman. And so I um, learned how to uh, throw net his style versus the others that who taught me before him, which were my cousins and my uncles. And before I could uh, learn to throw the net, I had to learn to patch it. And uh, the same process is uh, that I try to teach everyone that I'm uh, taking under my wing. Hopefully, they'll, they'll learn uh, how to do the basics before they, they start their venture into uh, designing their own things, uh, in particular the Macau. Um, the other people that were involved in, in uh, my teachings of uh, fish hooks, in particular, uh, Patrick Horimoto. Uh, Raymond Nakama, uh, and Dr. Sinoto. Uh, Dr. Sinoto is a uh, very well-known uh, archaeologist, not only in Hawaii, but also throughout Polynesia, and particularly uh, Tahiti and the uh, Marquesas. Uh, it was a funny story. I'll, I'll tell you the, how I first uh, got associated with Dr. Sinoto. He was going to uh, Tahiti and the Marquesas and Rapa Nui, on one of his uh, finding trips. It's about a uh, 16-day trip. And uh, he asked the group that I belong to, Pa Kuyalua, to accompany him. And when we're on the plane uh, going to uh, uh, Papaete, uh, I was preparing some Macau in the back. He was sitting first class. I was in the back. Uh, and I was preparing some fish hooks because I know that uh, when we hit other Polynesian um, uh, nations or islands is always a giving uh, and a custom. And so I knew that um, they would be giving us gifts, so I needed to do reciprocate and give them something back. So I had made a, well, being ambitious, I made 20 uh, Macau to give out. Just in case somebody gave me something, I would have something to give back. So I was sitting in the back um, putting the cordage on and a couple of his associates, uh, who he was training as archaeologists, came back and they saw what I was doing. Then they brought him back. And uh, he gave me a few pointers on uh, the designs. 
And uh, I was very surprised that he took the time out to even uh, do that because we had just met. And before he left to go back into the, the first class seats, he said, uh, Umi, I want you to put a mark on them. And at the time, I, didn't, I got a pen and put a mark on it. I didn't know what he was really talking about until uh, about the middle of the trip. He says, where's your mark? And I said, oh, I can add them with a the pen. He goes, no, 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 no. I need a deep mark in there. And I said, well, what's the mark for? He goes, so I know that you made it and not somebody who's going to come by and tell me that they found this in a cave. <laughs> and I, I said, wow. That, uh, I got surprised. I said, well, my hook must be pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so he says, with refining, it'll get better. So that was in 1995. So it's been me refining ever since then. So what I want to do tonight as a layman, I'm, uh, unfortunately, uh, I, I don't read much. So uh, everything that I have gathered as information has been through uh, discussions, talking with people, uh, and actually doing. Uh, uh, I can't read something and, and learn from that by doing it. I have to watch somebody uh, hands-on. So what I want to do is go through some of the slides uh, and recognize the three basic types of fish hooks recognized in the Hawaiian Islands. Okay, and uh, keep in mind that I'm a layman. Uh, as uh, Emily said, uh, I have a full-time job. Uh, this is just part-time as a hobby, uh, and loving to do it with my wife, who does the low hala. She she backs up a lot of the stuff I make. Uh, so we'll go through some of these slides. After the slides, I'm going to uh, pick out a few of the tools and, and demonstrate how they may have been used or how you would make a luhe. Uh, because a lot of people get confused. They can't put the, the cordage through the pukas in, in, the, in the lehu. Okay? And that's because I'll show you. Okay. The Hawaiian hooks are break, broken down into basically three types just to simplify them. Of course, within the three types, you have different shapes and sizes. Okay, one is the one-piece hook, a two-piece, and a composite. These are uh, a, variation, or a variety of different ones that Dr. Sonoto has uncovered. If you notice, on the top, you'll see three different types of um, well, he calls them heads. And this is where you would be tying the lashing to these heads. Okay? In the past, uh, the archaeologists couldn't determine the aging or the age process of uh, the different striations that they were uh, digging. Um, you know, we don't have pottery and stuff that would help date uh, a, a specific uh, find. Uh, but Dr. Sonoto went ahead and uh, did more research than ever before in the islands and came up with this as being the earliest with uh, dating uh, in approximately 900, 900 AD. This being the second phase of the uh, evolution of fish hooks. And then this being the latest, uh, as early as 1200 AD and uh, recognizing that 1650 being uh, the common place where uh, these types of heads would then dominate all the fish hooks. Okay. Here you can see a little uh, better the lashing of the early, the mid, and the latest. And this latest one is the one that we currently use. Okay. Here again, you can see depicting on the bone itself. Notice not only the, the heads differences, but also the bone. You see they go from a thicker um, a structure to a medium and then a thin. Okay? Uh, I'm not sure if the bones are getting uh, better or if uh, they just found out that uh, it was a much easier penetration through the, the fish's mouth to uh, have it thinner. But uh, the evolution got to a smaller and more uh, uh, stylized and thin uh, hook. Here again, 
the tops. And again, getting smaller. These are different variations of those without barbs. Here's a difference between, and very slight, with the Tahitian and the Hawaiian. And some of these are of shell as well. But basically, you see the evolution in the Tahitian as well. Close similarities. Going to the composite, there are a lot of tips that are made, um, but the composites also carry that same evolution. Um, in the earlier, you, I don't know if you can see it from there, they were just knobbed. The knobs are right there, right here. Then you went to a knob and a base. See the base there? The knob and the base. Till finally, it was just knobbed. From notch to notch and, and uh, the groove uh, up into just the notches. It was very important that um, Dr. Sonoto had identified these uh, age differences. Uh, it allowed other, other finds to be identified uh, by age. Here's a composite, and again, it shows you the, the knobbed or the uh, notched, then the semi, and then the knob. And you notice this uh, long shaft here are made of a dog bone. The Hawaiian dog bones, the uh, poi dogs, were uh, small in stature, so they, they, they suited well. Uh, today, the, the dogs um, that we can find the bones for are a little large, so it's hard, difficult to duplicate these. We just gonna need to go and get smaller dogs, convince the uh, Waipahu guys to eat smaller dogs. But you see, they also went, they also went to um, that knob, but also to a stronger, a stronger shaft. Here again, you see a variation, and how the evolution from a dog bone, which is relatively weak, we have a sample up here. The samples uh, to my far left are from the museum. Uh, the, t the one in the middle and the one closer to me on the left uh, are both Dr. Sinoto's private collection. And uh, he expects to get them back. So uh, I can't take them. But uh, take a look at those and you're going to see uh, the types of evolution and the, the style in which the, the two pieces were made. Here you have the two piece. Now, what was significant about the two-piece? They're usually larger. Yeah. Is it stronger or, or weaker than the one-piece? The two-piece is stronger. Okay. With this tying, it makes it much more, uh, it, it, it's flexible yet stronger than a one-piece bone uh, than you would see here because the breaking point is right here. So with the two-piece, they could get larger fish. Here are some samples of some uh, shell fish hooks. All kinds of different shapes, yeah? but basically the same. Uh, the the uh, shape was determined by the function, the function being which type of fish you're going to catch, how deep you're going to go, what size you're going to catch. Okay? If you're trying to make a, a uh, fish hook or anything else um, without a purpose or without a function in it, then you're just wasting your time. You need to determine what the function is going to be prior to making it. It'll determine the material you're going to use, the sizing, uh, and the shape. Here are more samples of fish hooks. Oh. 
We have um, another set of slides coming up. I'm dyslexic with computers too, so I needed the help. Yes. There you go. Thank you. I'm trying to identify. If you see this hook here, it's a two-piece, and you see the barb on the outside. Okay. Uh, versus you see others with the barb on the inside. This one is out and in. Okay. The barb for the Hawaiian hooks, when it's low and on the outside, is not for keeping the fish on after its bite. After it's um, bites the hook is for keeping your bait on. Okay. The inside hook uh, barb is for keeping the fish on. Okay. So normally, if you had a, a barb low and on the outside, you would have a piece of cord, oh, maybe six inches long, that would wrap around the bait um, and allow it not to slide up on the hook. Here are more samples of the the kinds of tips that were uh, made for for different functions, mostly for the uh, the two piece. In fact, all for the two piece. And these are just more samples of fish hooks. Here's an interesting one: uh, dog teeth, both the uh, canine and the molars. For the canine, you can only make a, a tip of a hook versus a whole hook. The molar in which you can use for making a whole hook, as you can see here. Very small. Most of the hooks are, are, are small hooks. You know, they keep catching reef fish. This one is an interesting shot. Uh, it's the largest hook uh, bone hook that uh, Dr. Sonoto has found, and it's made uh, from the pelvis bone of a human. How he knows that, I don't know. But. Now we're moving into a different kind of hook. It's more of a lure than it is a, a well, it's still a hook, but it's a lure. This is called a pahiaku. Pahi akus are for bonito or for aku. Uh, the hair you see on here are stabilizers. It allows it to stay stable and just shake uh, as you're uh, trolling with it. And it's made from the, the back hairs of a uh, wild pig or pig. The tips were fashioned out of bone. The bone could or could have been uh, shell. And of course the cordage is olona. This is a composite not only for the, the pahiaku, but also for the luhe'e. Luhe'e is a octopus lure. And for those uh, who may not know how to, to use an octopus lure, this is your luhe'e. Okay? Consists of a, a lehu or a shell. Uh, the stone down here is is the weighted end, uh, the hook, and a little tassel here, just to to like a kite tail almost. Okay. If the cord is coming out of the shell here, which is attached with a another bone knob here, and you're in your canoe, you would bob this up and down in the uh, on the floor of the the ocean. Maybe for this uh, old type of um, uh, lure with the old cordage, maybe 30, 35 feet at, at the most. You're bobbing this up, up and down. Two reasons. One, you want to find out and get used to the weight. Secondly, you're causing a commotion. That commotion allow, allows you to attract the hay who's in a hole maybe 10, 20 feet away. Okay, he sees the lehu. When he sees that lehu, bouncing around. He gets curious. He's a very curious animal. He comes over, jumps on the lehu because it's one of his favorite foods. And when he does, you, you know the extra weight is there. 
because you've been bobbing. Okay? Then you yank on it, he gets impaled, and you bring him up. If you're not fast enough to bring him to the surface, he's going to escape. So you've got to maintain that pressure okay? and bring him up quickly. This is what a, a lehu should really look like. In fact, a little, a little more burnt to get it oranger. That orange is uh, an attractant to the, the, the hay. He can see that better. So this shell would normally burn or put over the fire to get to this color. This one started off the same color. That's just another photo of a, a luhe. Uh, if you notice, the, the, the tip is a bit low. The cordage is a bit high. So uh, it, its catching abilities may, may not be as, as good as one that has a higher tip coming up here uh, because when that hay gets pulled and it comes back, it's going to ride over the top, especially with this cordage. Uh, a lot of the items uh, Dr. Sonota had pointed out um, a while back was uh, a lot of items were made for museum or for sale. Um, uh, and, and so this could be one of those types of uh, items. Uh, it looks practical, but uh, you have to take a deeper look into it. These are old, old, old valuable ones made this year. Uh, these are the ones I made. <laughs> Just to give you an idea of the, the transition. Now, you see any difference in the, the hooks I made versus the hooks that we, we showed earlier? These are a lot thicker. And that's because they're more ornamental. Today, the Hawaiians wear a hook around their neck uh, as a symbol or as a uh, reminder of the Hawaiian culture. Uh, in Kahiko days, or ancient days, they wouldn't wear a hook around their neck. They were too valuable. They were too precious. They were regarded as being a uh, provider. So they were very cared for. And in caring for them, uh, you wouldn't uh, come out. Uh, also, you wouldn't want to share uh, your design with other fishermen. Yeah. But you, you, you would cherish them, uh, not like the way you, we wear them today. <laughs> Just more of my junk. Uh, you can see here, here's how I start off uh, after cutting the bone. And then this would be a, a similar fi uh, finished product. There's that inner barb. There's the outer barb. This is mother of pearl. This is a big hook. This is a uh, kiholo. A kiholo is a shark hook. Okay. Uh, you'll see a sample of the stages in which you can uh, do the whipping up here, uh, or the plating. Actually, it's plating. This is another one. Uh, we did this as a uh, commemoration uh, to a family that uh, donated the hook that you see in the Bishop Museum. It's Manaya Kalani, uh, said to be the hook of Maui. Uh, that brought up all the islands. So this is a replica of one of the replicas that we made, and it, it takes the same curves. On a shark hook, it's made out of wood, but you don't take a, a flat piece of wood and then cut out the design and add a, a tip to it. You have to train a tree branch or you train a, a root because you want that grains to be consistently running with the shape uh, Otherwise, it'll be too brittle and it'll break. If we were to use this one, it would break right here. We tried to use the wood and cut it so that we would have the grain. But if you see right here, the grain is running across rather than up. Uh, right here is running across. So it's not very strong. It, it, it would hold maybe uh, 100 pounds or more, but uh, for a big shark, it wouldn't hold. You know, when we um, talk about fishing or fish hooks, we also have to talk about uh, fish traps 
and for uh, uh, fish traps, they're called hinai's. Um, hinai also refers to a container. And uh, so you have a hinai, uh, makau, which is a which is a basket in which the valuable fish hooks to be placed. Okay. Then it's kept right next to the fisherman when he goes to sleep. Uh, he also would have cordage that come out, go through the sides, come out the top, and so he can secure it so that the cover doesn't come off. So in case he's at sea, it falls over. He'll be able to uh, keep all the hooks together and recover them. Uh, Hinai also refers to fish traps. Oh, and this one is a kumu trap. The kumu trap is here, uh, and I can't, this hinai down here, it, it was supposed to be this, but I couldn't get the photo wide enough. <laughs> but uh, that's how I, uh, the slides that we have for tonight. And do uh, you have any questions before I move into some of the more details about how I make them? Yes. The flat ones are for smaller fish, uh, and the material dictates also what thickness you're going to get. So if you're working with uh, turtle shell, like this, and of course you're not going to get it very thick, okay? So you're not going to catch very, very large fish. And if you're catching manini or uh, enenui uh, or anything, reef ship fish, then you don't need it that thick. But anything larger and anything that fights, if you call it a papillo, you want something a little stronger. So the thickness, again, uh, you need to determine your purpose or your function before you can make a proper size hook. Uh, also consider the thicker the, 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 uh, the tip of the, the hook is, the wider the hole it's going to make in the fish's mouth. So when you try to pull them in, it's going to be easier to uh, rip its mouth open and lose the fish than it is on a thinner one. Okay. I hope that was a question. Okay. Anybody else before I move into some other things? Well, both of them are two pieces. Okay, but the composite uh, really dictates that it is uh, a um, a uh, Tip, bone, and any other subject. Uh, it, it could a composite uh, meaning uh, like the luhe. Okay, it's really a lure than it is a hook. So it's you're, you're putting two different types of materials together uh, that are completely off from each other, and it's not a tip and a shaft. Okay, that's a two-piece tip and a shaft, whereas the luhe has a tip and a, a shell and a, and a piece of stone and everything else. Uh, uh, I don't know how else to explain that. Anybody else had that same question? Anybody else know the answer? Yeah, yes. Yeah, well, it could be two different ones, uh, but it has a a shaft and and a point. Yeah, it can be two different types. Uh, there was a photograph in here. I don't know if I still have it on this one. Here, here. You see this shaft here? Anybody know what that might be made out of? What kind of material Hawaiians would have had that was black? Uhi uhi. Yeah, but this is not wood. Okay, he's talking about uhi uhi wood, yeah. okay. black coral. Okay, but the Hawaiians didn't use black coral back then in Kahiko days. This one uh, it has been identified by Dr. Sonoto as being uh, one of the, the the hooks that was made for sale uh, to a museum or to a collector uh, in the the. Uh, early 1900s. 
So this would be a two-piece, but still two different types of materials, but still a hook design. Huh? Two-piece. I'm sorry? Black coral. Sorry, black coral. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Yes. You mean the uh, the point left versus the point right? I just turn them around. <laughs> There's no significance. Yeah, unless you're wearing them, then there might be a significance because uh, when you you start to make them out of the beef bone or any other types of bone, uh, if you're making them with a narrow piece, you're going to have some that have the marrow type. Uh, uh, airy surface versus the solid surface, but that would be the only time more of a um, ornamental um, preference. Is that for me? <laughs> Any other questions? What I wanted to do is show you some of the tools that were used in Kahiko days and some of the tools that I use today in making a, uh, making a Macau and uh, a Luhe. Okay, so hang on just a moment. My technical person is gonna switch us to a uh, camera where you can see what I'm doing up here instead of having to strain your eyes. Ooh, fancy, huh? And I was joking with him when I told him I needed a camera to show everything. Okay. Everybody know what, are familiar with this? Okay, what's it called? Black and Decker. Okay. <laughs> This is called, it's a pump drill. Okay, the Hawaiian term for it is vili. Okay. A vili works only if it has a flywheel. Without a flywheel, a vili cannot work. The flywheels are made out of wood, out of stone, or out of coral. The tip, always iron, right? Always metal. No, the Hawaiians didn't have metal. The tips... The tips were made from a cone shell, the inner portion of the cone shell, which looks like this. Okay, Or it could be made out of a uh, mako shark tooth, which is long and narrow. Or it could be made out of obsidian, a piece of obsidian. Or if it's a, a piece that you is thin enough and the hole is small enough, you could use a rat's tooth. Okay, But a Vili is very simple to use. You have to charge it up, put it where, put it where you need to uh, drill, and rhythmically go up and down. Okay? Now you see it's spinning, but it's not drilling, because the last thing you need is downward force. Okay, watch when I put a downward force. I'm going to leave this out um, after the lecture. If you want to try it, you can. The reason I use the, the steel or the, it's, it's, all, it's just an ordinary nail, but the reason I use that is because too many times uh, my bits get broken off because once you drill it in, you don't bend to take it out. You drill it straight up. Can you see the tip on this one? That would be a kahiko tip. Okay, this is made out of the shell. And I made this really portable. So the drill, 
to drill in the bone is the first uh, uh, step in making your makau. So you would drill it this way into the bone. And once it's through, you can see uh, the hole starting there. Okay. Once it goes through uh, halfway, then you go on the other side and drill. A village tip, because of the shape on it, can't go all the way through. You can only go about halfway, then you go to the other side and go the other half. So if you see something that somebody says, this is a old, old, uh, ancient uh, item and it has a hole through it, you look at the hole. If the hole is clear all the way through uh, one dimension, then you know it was made with a metal tip. Okay? If, it, if it has um, a tapered look to it and smaller in the middle and tapered out, then it would be a, probably a vili or vili tip. Other items they would have used would be coral files or saws, sandpaper. This one happens to be color, not uh, shark, but they could also use shark. Files. Made from the... Um, or sea urchin spine, and you can see some of these I've been using t not on a regular basis, but just to test them out. Uh, these are other files made out of coral. Coral can be very abrasive, but it, they'll wear down, so you're going to have to gather a lot. Another shell that uh, or material that was used was uh, the broken end of a quarry shell. And I don't know if you can see the drawing that I had on here, but uh, it's in pencil. I would make a hook from this quarry shell. Types of material. Today we use beef bone. It's uh, readily available and it's uh, tougher than the types of bones they used in the past, which was uh, pig bone, uh, human bone, dog bone, dog teeth, as we had uh, seen, uh, as well as uh, uh, turtle shell. Uh, and the shell that I showed you is another piece of turtle shell. Here's a, a knife that was used to score. This is another drill bit uh, I designed so that it would be tapered smaller. But again, as you can see here, because it, it uh, widens up here, you can't go very deep. You have to turn the material over and go on the other side. Let's see the composites uh, or the composite material that you would need to make a luhe. This is the finished product. Getting too crowded here. You would need your pohaku. You need your lehu. You need your wooden stick. Now, um, there are a lot of archaeologists will say that the stick should be round. Uh, but in making them, I find that the it, it turns and slips too easily. So I'd rather have it squared. Uh, so I always have a battle with Dr. Sonoto because uh, I make mine square. <laughs> uh, square it off so that it holds better. And he's coming to realize, that, oh, yeah, it works better that way. Okay. So how do you get the string through these holes, the hole here and the hole here, in order to tie it down? 
And I ask that if you've tried it before, it's almost impossible uh, to get it through uh, because there's a piece of the shell on the interior that you need to knock out first. Okay? If you don't knock this, sorry, if you don't knock out this portion right here, you can't get your string through. So here is it knocked out. Okay. How did they do it in Kahiko days? They would score it with a uh, shark tooth, just making your scores on it, uh, making sure that there's a line all the way down from where you want to uh, tap it off, and then tap it and keep tapping it until all of that comes off. Today, I use a drummel with an aggressive tip. I'm sorry. You could use a lay needle, but your string, it, uh, uh, it, it would be a difficult because your lay needle is pretty rigid. And then you're trying to go all the way around. You have to go over a hump to get it in to the other side. And then your cordage wouldn't be taunt. You want that cordage to be taunt too. Now, how would you make a pahiaku? You would take the pa shell, yeah, and you would cut out the base. This is the base for your start of your pahiaku, your uh, your bonito lure, right? So if you take a look at this, and you start to cut your shell, you're going to cut it incorrectly because you haven't marked it out correctly. Can you see the pencil mark? And you see this knob right here? The bigger the shell, is, the, uh, the, the bigger this knob is going to be. And that's the knob you need to create that base there. <laughs> it's like going in a mirror, huh? Okay. So if you cut yours uh, just by using any portion of the shell, uh, you won't make a successful one. You can only get one pahiaku out of each side, each shell. Okay. See the design there? Yeah, you, you would cut it with a shark tooth. Yeah. Well, it depends. If I got 13 grandkids. If they leave me alone, then we can score maybe a maybe. A, um, eight to nine hours, yeah, but uh, you'd be going through at least six to eight teeth as well, yeah. Um, I tried it once, and it worked, but I, I don't want to do it again. I, I use a Dremel now. <laughs> you have more appreciation for the, uh, the ancients when, when you start to do it with the tools that they had, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but they had a lot of fun, though. <laughs> uh, cutting the, the bone, if you don't have a bandsaw to cut it, you can use a uh, uh, coping saw. Uh, you can get one like this and a clamp and a uh, anvil base. Uh, this one I cut out of an old table. This one came from City Mill. This came from City Mill. Okay. If you want to get a little more uh, fancy with your stuff and if you're going to do it on a regular basis, then you want to get uh, better equipment and you can get those at jewelry stores and um, buy the better saws and the better anvils. Um, Rangi has a very nice anvil that he uses, um, multi-purpose. Uh, the files, I don't use the, the coral files. I use a file like this to shape with, and it's a uh, wax file. They call it a wax file. And uh, they say they use it for people who are carving in wax. I don't know why, because it, it just clogs it up. Then we also use diamond tip files, diamond studded. 
And I think that's about all I have for right now. Does anybody have any questions? Cut the hole? You, uh, in traditional way? You use these saws. This one here. Where's the other one? And this one. Or you can use a shark's tooth. That's why they were so valuable. It takes a while. Okay? Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure they didn't sit there until they were finished. They had to do other things. They had to go pound poi and then come back and work on it again, you know. But... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, so the the kame was a lot of blood and sweat. Yeah, more more sweat. <laughs> yeah, shiny is if you're going to sell it. Uh, people 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 want the shiny one. If you're going to use it, then it's a it, the the uh, oranger it gets the 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 uh, more attractive it, it is. When you fire it, yeah, you be careful. Yeah, you got to, yeah, like everything else, you, you have to temper yourself, you know. You burn it slowly. Uh, you hold it over the fire uh, with something besides your hand uh, because the shell can get very hot before it turns color. Okay, so you can put a, a piece of uh, bamboo in it, make sure the bamboo has been soaked first, uh, and stick it in the shell, and then uh, burn it. You could um, get a, a mini torch and burn it. That's the fastest way. But uh, a lot of people, like I'll show you one that's made today. This is the basics of a uh, contemporary luhe. That's a lead base with stainless steel uh, uh, rods coming out from it and, and embedded in it. Then we add the, the lehu to it. Okay. And this is actually one that's in use. Uh, my nephew uses this one. And he added this pink to be the attractive portion because he didn't want to burn the shell. Okay. And it works. In this one? There's no, there's no tie-in. This is melted lead. This one here? Oh, yeah. Uh, you use another stone. Uh, you could use one that has a, an edge on it, and you slowly go across. Keep marking it and marking it, and your mark gets better, bigger and deeper. You can also use a Dremel and make it a lot faster. Um, 18 to 1. No. <laughs> There's no ratio. <laughs> There's no ratio to it. It's, determined, it's dependent upon what you feel uh, is comfortable for you. Some of these stones you're going to feel are heavier than others. Okay? That's because the, the person that's using it likes to have a heavy one. Okay? Come and feel this, uh, this lead. I'll pass this one. These luhe that are used today, uh, I had mentioned to you on the uh, kahiko ones, they maybe 35 feet uh, is really effective. But the ones today, they're going down to 100 feet. And they're catching some big hay. Uh, and that's because they have the electric winch to bring it up. Okay, it's not by hand. Uh, by hand, maybe 50 feet with these, but if you feel the weight on these, it's pretty heavy. Okay. I'm sorry? Not for these. Yeah. 
they use a regular fishing line, about 800 pound test. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Olona uh, was used as a fishing line, and it's the second strongest natural fiber in the world. Ramy is the, nat the first uh, strongest natural fiber in the world. And it was stated that uh, the Olona farmer or producer is probably one of the richest men in the village or the Kauhale area because everybody needed uh, Olona, uh, not only for fishing but for other purposes as well. We're trying to encourage people to, um, to grow Olona again. And there's uh, some people on Maui that's starting a farm, an Olona farm. Yes. You know, the, 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 so the lashing, if you look at, where's that? Oh, sorry, I'm on a camera. Uh, if you look at the lashings um, uh, in Kahiko days, you really can't tell what kind of style they were because they'll bundle it all up at the end. Okay, they'll start off neat, and then they'll start to bundle. And that's so that uh, if the fish scrapes it or the, the coral reef scrapes it, uh, it won't uh, break off. Okay? Uh, for the, the knob, it's probably just one. It's a figure eight. Uh, it's a, uh, I don't know how to describe it. I, I can show you, but it's hard to describe. But that, uh, uh, that figure eight was the probably the most dominant of the uh, tying or the lashing methods. When we went down to uh, Rapa Nui and to uh, Marquesas with Dr. Sonotan in 1995, the Marquesans were uh, heavily carving uh, Macau and, and different other ki'i and, and such, but they had lost the, uh, the technique in tying uh, in some of the villages. They, they didn't know how to lash the, um, the Macau properly. So we held classes uh, as we went to each village and showed the carvers. And it didn't take long. And uh, uh, now they, they lash them uh, in the, the older manner. Sorry, James, I forgot to repeat all the questions. Anybody else? The question was, how do you drill a small hole in a shell or bone or anything? Yeah, uh, with the vili, if you get a rat's tooth, uh, you can drill a very small hole. They had big rats then, uh, big teeth. But uh, you can use that, or you can fine-tune your shell so that it becomes very thin. But you've got to be real slow and careful with that, because otherwise the tip will break off. Yeah, the question is, Manaya Kalani has a name, and it's actually a kiholo. Kiholo is a general term for f uh, shark hook, uh, but it had a specific name. Uh, and I would say, uh, I wasn't there back then, but uh, I would say that they, if they had a valuable fish hook, one that they cherished, they probably named it, like they named a lot of items. But in giving names to a fish hook, a weapon, uh, or anything else, uh, it takes on a life of itself. So you have to be very, very careful when you give names out, uh, names of objects or names to people. Same thing. Okay? Be very careful, be v very aware of what you're doing and the, uh, the purpose uh, and the meaning behind the name. Uh, some of the names, I understand, carried uh, the name of the chief that it came from. Yeah. So if it came from uh, Napoleon, uh, then, then it would have been called Napoleon. <laughs> but you have to care for that, uh, properly care for it, otherwise the Wuhani uh, could turn on you. Yes, yes.
practice. <laughs> the, the question was, if you're only going part way or halfway into a, a drilling process, how do you find the other side? And, and, and seriously, it's practice. Uh, I, even with a Dremel, if I'm drilling a hole through a thicker piece, like um, Niho Plawa, I'll drill from one side and then turn it on the other side and drill. But I'm marking it with my finger, okay? And it does take practice, okay? So if you're going to do it on a regular basis, you'll get it. If, if you're going to do a one-off, then use a drill, drill press. <laughs> Yes. For something that big, you probably could. Um, for but uh, it, it, I think a shark hook is good for anything that bites it. Uh, and I think that's how they probably caught. Uh, marlin and swordfish as well, uh, more by mistake than on purpose. Okay, because the other technique of catching a shark was to uh, test a man's manhood, and a warrior's uh, graduation was to lasso the tail of a, uh, a newhi, a man-eating shark, between the double hull canoe. Uh, once his tail is captured, then he's to jump on the shark and uh, kill it and eat his eyeball and uh, to prove himself a worthy warrior. So uh, there are different ways to, to get a shark. And uh, the pelagic sharks, like the great white and the tiger shark and some of the other big sharks that live out in the deeper waters, those are not aumakua. So a lot of people say, oh, you can't go out and kill those sharks. But they're really not aumakua. Okay, the aumakua were those close inner shore reef sharks that frequent the area in which you reside. Those are your almakua, okay? Uh, and not all of them, just the one, the one that had the name that your grandparents gave to them, the one that you feed, the one that you care for, okay? So don't get misled that you can go out in the ocean and uh, be uh, fearless with all of the sharks that are close by, yeah. Same with Puel, same with anything else. Yeah, it's not only the sharks. The Hawaiians revered the sharks. They, um, uh, they, they praised the shark. They also ate the shark. They, it was a delicacy. Uh, once they catch uh, a, a large shark, they would cut up the meat into cubes, then throw it into the uh, hull of a canoe, and then put uh, salt water into the canoe hull, and let it sit there for a day or two to get that... Uh, shark taste out of it uh, and salt it. Then they'd bring it out and eat it. Yeah. So it was a delicacy. Anybody else? Yes. You mean, I'm sorry, it was bait you were saying, yeah. Uh, the question was what kind of bait and what kind of um, chumming system. They did chum, okay. Um, for the shark, if they wanted to catch shark, they would take flesh from uh, uh, animal or from a human and actually put it into a umeke uh, and let it sit for a couple, four to five days and let it miko. Um, let it get very, uh, very meekle uh, to a point where it's hauna. And uh, they would tend uh, take a piece of that meat, put it on the hook, but also on, uh, when, they, when they're ready to throw the hook in, they would pour that gravy, that delicious gravy, into the water as a chum. Uh, they also did uh, uh, bags, and they, uh, they had bait, bait sticks as well that they would use to chum the water. Then they drop the hook in. Yeah, baits could take a lot of different forms. But for the shark, it was uh, 
uh, meat that they would use, not other fish. Okay, I, th I think uh, the museum people are passing out an exam. <laughs> what? If, <laughs> uh oh. So are you any no, I'm not. I'm sorry, the question was, am I making any um, Macau for Hokuleo on their worldwide trip? Yeah, they want something dependable. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. I don't know uh, who is making any, if they're making any at all. I just completed two workshops on Macau and uh, another workshop I did on Leo Mano uh, down at Windward Community College. Uh, Leo Mano is a uh, is a paddle uh, with shark teeth laid in it uh, as a weapon. I'm an implement maker. Uh, I, I I'm not a creative carver, uh, nor am I a carver. I just shape wood. I shape uh, shells and different other material. And um, because I'm not creative either, I follow all of the uh, traditional designs, which I like better. There's a certain simplicity uh, or elegance within the simplicity. And uh, if you notice, the Hawaiian designs are very simple, um, but very elegant and very functional. Okay? Again, functionality is the key in, in making any implement. No more questions? You can come up and take a look at uh, these things in this glass case that's half opened our mind. That was, and also uh, Mickey, who's sitting over there, he made three items uh, from a class that we had. And uh, the other, again, uh, on that side, the Luhe's belong to the museum, and the other two boxes are items that are the personal collection of Dr. Sinoto. Thank you very much. Mahalo for listening. If you have any questions or comments on this or other online audio programs, please visit us online at www.bishopmuseum.org. If you like us on Facebook, you'll be alerted when new programs are available. Ahui ho from the Bishop Museum.